Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. We, I appreciate that. Um, welcome. I hope you are all having a wonderful new year and here's to hoping that, that we get COVID behind us in this year. Um, the next item of business is approval of the minutes for the um, meeting of the regular meeting of December 8th, 2020. Can I will let, I would entertain a motion? Uh, Madam President, I move to approve the minutes of December 8th of 2020. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the regular meeting minutes of December 8th, 2020. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Christensen? Yes. Ms. Lincoln? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Lehrman? Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda review, um, Ms. Whitney. Good evening, Board President. There are no additions or changes to the agenda. However, I would call your attention to the request for an executive session under 4231101G for personnel. It's your opportunity to complete superintendent evaluation in January. So tonight will be the first of two meetings. Thank you. We will now move on to audience comments and turn the time over to Superintendent Whitney for that. So thank you, Board President Phillips. I did want to just remind the board that tonight we're doing live public comments. So participants would need to use the raised hand feature. I can see a number of attendees, but only four with their hand raised. So our commenter, which is our, our uh, Mark Garrett, will be mediating or moderating the comments. So I'll turn it over to Mark Garrett. Thank you. Perfect. Yes, please, if you want to make a, a comment, um, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll just go down the list. We'll call on you. You have two minutes to make your, your comment and um, we'll try to give you a heads up when you're on deck. Once your two minutes are up or your comment is complete, we will um, we'll mute your mic and, and lower your hand. That way we can keep track of um, everyone that still needs to make a comment. Mark, before you get started, could yeah. you just describe for our attendees where they might find the hand raising sure. function? Sure. So it should be, there should be only two buttons on the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> There's a, a chat button um, that doesn't do much. It's disabled. And then there's a raise hand button. So click that. And I believe when you click it, it'll turn, um, it'll turn blue to let you know that your hand's raised. And, um, and then we can, we can see the list of people that have their hand raised on our side. Um, I'll let you know when, when we enable your microphone, there'll be a, a pop-up that shows on your screen that, that says the host would like you to, um, to unmute your microphone. Go ahead and click unmute and then feel free to make your comment. Okay, so please, if you haven't already, raise your hand and we will get started. So the, the first person to um, make a comment is going to be Gwendolyn Adamson. And then the person on deck is going to be Heather Kubalik. All right, so Gwendolyn, your microphone has been enabled. Go ahead and click unmute and please make your comment. Uh, dear Pasco School Board members and Superintendent Whitney, for those of you who do not know me, um, I'm Gwen Adamson. I teach at Edward Markham Elementary School. I'm the librarian there. And I'm also a PAE rep for our building. I'm concerned about the amount of quality instruction that our students are receiving. The students in our district are being denied the opportunity to receive full-time in-person learning. I think that we should reconsider this decision and move forward with full-time instruction that's in-person. A study regarding COVID-19 in, in Swedish school children was published in January 
on January 6th of 2021, so just a week ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a well-known and prestigious peer-reviewed journal. Schools in Sweden never closed during the pandemic and data was taken from March to June of 2020. The study found that among children seven to 16 years old, only one in 130,000 was hospitalized due to COVID-19. School teachers in Sweden were 57% less likely to be hospitalized due to COVID-19 than other adults in other occupations. It is safe for teachers to be in the building with children. That population though does not include our healthcare workers in that study. We need a data-driven approach. The science shows that in-person learning is safe. The further away that we get from full-time in-person learning, the greater inequality we invoke upon children with an opt without an optimal home learning environment. We need to do the right thing for all kids and get them back in school full-time where they belong. Long distance learning is not equitable for our students and we need to put them back in our, in our schools with their teachers as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Adamson. Heather Kubalik is up next. And after uh, Ms. Kubalik, it'll be uh, Wendy Boyce. Mrs. Kubalik, your microphone is unmuted. All right, thank you for this opportunity to speak for a moment. I just wanted to say I fully support the health district's recommendation to extend the elementary school day. Governor Inslee's recommendation in December regarding school reopenings included the following information. The new guidelines are based on our new data that has given us high confidence and shows that schools can successfully limit the transmission of COVID-19 when they have strong health and safety protocols in place in their schools. I have definitely seen that in PASCO that we have those strong protocols in place. He also said we have data and research now that we didn't have three months ago. He shared a graph showing the community transmission rates under different school scenarios. No mitigation or regular in-person school has an r naught between 1.15 and 1.3. All in-person school with mitigation like masks and social distancing is between 0.9 and 0.95. And all remote is 0 0.90. So this information is very telling. Having our students be remote is causing all sorts of problems and is not actually making a difference in the community transmission rates. It's time to begin the process of bringing all of our students back. I see that uh, BFHG just today recommended middle and high school students to return to in-person. Sorry if you can't hear me over my kids. <laughs> I urge you to prepare so that they can return as soon as possible. Waiting till the beginning of the third trimester will mean our kids have been in remote learning for a full year. It also means these kids will not get the critical help they need in these trimester two classes now. We have to start these kids back sooner. And I know the school district can do it safely. Thank you for your continued work during this difficult time. Hi, I'm Wendy Buse. I'm a teacher at Edwin Markham Elementary. Um, I just have some short comments um, and echo what has previously just been said. Um, I feel I would felt relieved in mid-December when our governor, Jay Inslee, had put out um, his recommendation that all students return to in-person learning um, and in classes, class groups of 15 or less. Um, I have 12 students in my class. I would love to have them all at the same time. At this time, I only have six at a time. Um, and that concerns me because I know that a neighboring school district, Rich, Richland has their kids five days a week for elementary for two and a half hours a day. And that equates to a lot more time in person instruction and learning than what we are giving our Pasco School District elementary students. Um, I also just recent, 
recently heard that Walla Walla is now, who did go back virtual, is now returning to in hybrid or in-person instruction and also planning for their middle and high school students. It seems like this would be um, a big step backwards if we decided to go fully remote virtual instruction. In my case, the students in my classroom are thriving and it's when they are at home that not as much work is getting done and they're falling behind. So to return to remote instruction would be detrimental. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Boyce, Mrs. Payne. You're up next after Mrs. Payne will be Sarah Woods. Mrs. Payne, your microphone's enabled. Thank you. My name is April Payne and I'm a parent of a middle and high schooler, a community member and a teacher. I want to acknowledge the hard work the school board and the district has done with everything going on. I was particularly impressed with the number 75 listed on last meeting's presentation because that's the percentage of our parents that want their children back in school. Our teacher's responsibility um, is students and parents. I did not choose to be a teacher to focus the need on myself. Instead, I check my own ego at the door and walk in with a positive attitude and a smile, even if the world or my personal life happens to be crazy at the moment. Just like medical professionals and grocery store workers, teachers are essential because who else educated the Pfizer and Modera to create a vaccine for COVID? Who else educated our medical professionals to help the sick? However, teachers are lucky because we see the same students and coworkers day after day. Grocery store retail workers and medical professionals are not that fortunate. They see hundreds and hundreds of people each day, which means more germs. As a community member and parent, I teach my daughters respect. Not respect when I agree with something, but respect in general. We need to be respectful of the health department and you as school board members who have made difficult decisions. Best practices are for students to be back in school. Outbreaks have not occurred in our district, and I want to acknowledge that our private schools who have been open this whole time have not had outbreaks either. All students really need to be with us five days a week in person. This modified blending learning is not meeting student needs, but it has helped. Distance learning is very disproportionate because my special education students were not getting their needs met whatsoever. I was missing a number of students from September to November during distance learning, and these were my lowest ones. As soon as school opened up, they attended, but now they are even further behind. These kids are our future. Middle and high school students are failing. The Tri-Cities has had three suicides in just a few months. They were high schoolers who did not have access to what they needed. Counselors are now book solid when we need them the most. My daughter who has needs and wrote you a letter during the last board meeting has been an AB student since kindergarten. Now she has a 0.25 GPA. It's easy to blame me as the parent, but I work full time. She is 100% remote and has needs that only a school can provide. It's important to unite together. And with that, I am uniting with you to stand strong, believe in our capabilities to open up all of our schools and support our parents so that no more learning is lost. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Payne. Sarah Woods, you're next uh, to comment. And then Elizabeth Ranga Lee will be after Sarah. Ms. Woods, your microphone is enabled. Hi, my name is Sarah Woods and I'm an eighth grade science teacher at Ray Reynolds Middle School. My thanks to the board and superintendent for the difficult work they are currently undertaking. No one denies that teachers and students would prefer to be meeting in person. I assure you there is no place I'd rather be spending my days than in a classroom full of eighth graders building trebuchets and catapults in the pursuit of learning physics. Teaching takes all kinds. Our district has been relying on the Benton Franklin Health Department to guide decisions regarding reopening. Our health department's priority should be to promote the health of the community based on scientific evidence and best practices. BFHD is failing us, pushing ahead with reopening despite the recommendations of the scientific community at large. For the CDC, case rates over 200 create the highest risk for in-school transmission. The state recommends that counties with rates over 350 just begin phasing K-3 to into a hybrid model. With local case rates over 700 and holiday peaks topping 1,000, BFHD has not only approved K-5 through meeting in person, but now they're eating of lunch in shared indoor spaces. 
Why are state and national recommendations what they are? It is impossible to assess whether in-person schooling is contributing to community case rates when they're already so high. The CDC estimates that 59% of all coronavirus cases are transmitted by asymptomatic persons. Children are no less likely to contract or transmit COVID-19 than adults, but they are more likely to be asymptomatic. Mitigation measures help decrease transmission, but to quote UW co-author, sorry, UW study co-author Dan Goldhaber, if you are in a county that has high pre-existing rates of infection, then it does look like it is more dangerous to have the school open in person. This information in mind, please ask yourself, do the potential benefits of starting in-person schooling now rather than in a few months when case rates have dropped or vaccinations taken place outweigh the increased risk to our community as a whole? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Woods. Mrs. Lee, Baranga Lee, um, you are next and then uh, Scott Wilson is on deck. Mrs. Rangali, your microphone is enabled. Thank you. Um, good evening, school board and superintendent. Um, I'll be short and direct. I, um, I believe it is wrong that the Pasco School District and Benton Franklin Health District are ignoring the state guidelines for the return of in-person school. As previously stated, um, our numbers are double um, what is recommended by the state. And I also looked up some other states. We are higher than the number recommended for in-person learning for Arizona, California, Colorado, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Oregon, and West Virginia. Um, I think this is irresponsible for health, um, from the health perspective. I'm also very worried that we are continuing to take more and more time, uh, teacher time away from our distance learners. It is not equitable to have um, this time getting taken away. I am teach at CHESS and um, on the east side and more and more of my students are transitioning from in-person to distance learning. Um, and every week I'm losing more kids to distance learning. And I think this is true for most of, of my school. I don't know other schools, but I my time that I've been given to work with these kids has um, been reduced now and it keeps getting reduced. Now I'm at 30 minutes a day with the distance learning kids. I don't think that's fair or equitable. These are kids coming from families. They're prioritizing their health and we shouldn't be giving them an inferior education because the families are deciding with that decision to keep their kids home. If we go to full day, that time with the distance kids is gonna be reduced even more. And um, it's very frustrating for me because the parents choosing um, distance learning are often less affluent. They also don't have the same access to healthcare um, that some of the other um, families in our community do. And it's just, it's not okay that their voices aren't getting heard and that the time with these students is being reduced. Um, thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Baranga Lee for your comments. Scott Wilson, you're up next. And then uh, on deck is Melissa Morris. If you, just a reminder, if you would like to make a public comment, please raise your digital hand at the bottom of your screen. Scott Wilson, your microphone has been enabled. Thank you. Scott Wilson is president of the Pasco Association of Educators. There are decisions to be made. You stand on the lawn of the US Capitol as people break down barriers and head to the doors. Do you follow? You stand at the governor's mansion, the crowd breaks down barriers to enter the grounds. Do you follow or do you choose a different way? We must not ignore the culture of white supremacy and white privilege. We have seen it in the free to breathe, reopen everything, rodeos and rallies that received county commissioner support. The same commissioner directs our health district. No one wants remote learning. No one wants remote learning, but it is the right thing to do. We know the equity concerns. Virus transmission is high, headed higher. With so many ignoring and avoiding measures to stop the spread, remote learning is the right decision. You've moved forward as the health district removes the barricades for you. You could choose a different way. You could move to pause in-person learning. You could ask for a new path that benefits all, not some. You could have the discussion and vote. You could choose a different way. Students are not coming to school. 
They live in multi-generational homes and have lost family members. We speak of equity. We speak of care of all students. And yet we listen and attend to voices saying, reopen everything and free to breathe, supporting white privilege. My family had to leave the Tri-Cities in 66. As minister of the First Presbyterian Church of Kennewick, dad had the audacity to say Jesus Christ would not support a sign telling blacks, stay out of Kennewick after dark. He traveled registering black voters in the South and white supremacists here were outraged. He made the right decision. You receive the same emails as I, calling teachers lazy or comparing teachers to store clerks. They complain their children are suicidal without school or sports. As a father daily surviving the suicide of my son, I find these statements ignorant and another expression of white privilege. Huge daily death, death tolls from this pandemic, seditious attacks at our capital, plus a new, more transmittable strain of the virus while our case numbers are rising again. You have the authority to hit pause. Allow time to find a way forward through the end of the year. You could choose a different way. Thank you, members of the board and Superintendent Whitney. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Wilson. Don Johnson is up next and after that will be Kay Anderson. Don Johnson, your microphone is enabled. Excuse me. Good evening, Ms. Whitney and the board members. I appreciate this opportunity to express myself. I'm a sixth grade math and science teacher at, um, at Stevens Middle School. I'm also a transplant recipient. I was lucky enough two and a half years ago to get a, a new kidney from one of my girlfriends um, because I um, was born with one kidney and contracted a disease called uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS. Anyway, um, I'm healthy, my kidney is healthy, but I am at super high risk of, um, I have no immune system. Um, and as a result of the medications, the transplant medications, I have also developed diabetes. So um, I just wanted to make a few thoughts. That's my personal, but um, I just wanted to remind people that um, I'd rather be in-person learning as well. I miss the kids so much. Um, I miss everything about in-person teaching. Um, I've got all these, you would not believe how many different things I have to enhance learning um, that are all hands-on. So it makes me super sad. But I'd like to remind you all, science is evolving. Many people use Sweden's um, approach at the, their initial approach last summer as an example of what we need to do or in defense of what we need to do. I would like to remind everyone that as of December 2020, Sweden's rates have far surpassed any of their neighboring countries, and they did close down high schools as of December 3rd, 2020. Um, <clears throat> so um, science, the science is changing all the time. It's a fairly new disease and um, almost always uh, science has evolved. I will give another example, um, or my concern is the long-term risks. Nobody knows what they are. The disease has only been around for just over a year. Um, my mother, when I was two years old, took me to a chicken pox party um, so that I would catch chicken pox when I was nice and early and she could watch me. And um, nobody knew at that time, it was two more generations before you knew that was the direct cause of shingles. And shingles can be a really debilitating disease. Um, nobody knows what the future is of any of these children who are maybe asymptomatic but have contracted COVID, and we just don't know their future. Um, uh, the last thing I'd like to say is I've been at the school district. Um, I try really hard to not go into the school, and I've um, had some teachers been very kind to drop off some items to me, but um, I have visited the school seven times in the spring and I visited eight times in the fall and not once have I not run into somebody who doesn't have a mask on. I've heard at board member uh, board meetings, I've heard in the media, I've heard um, from the Benton Franklin Health Department that as long as everybody follows protocols, everybody will be kept safe. Um, I've tried to photo follow protocols, but I can't be responsible for um, somebody from the board and it has not, please, please, please do not blame Stephen. Stephen's staff was not um, in the most cases, it was not them. Um, I've gone to. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Johnson. Our two minutes is up. Next up is Kay Anderson. And after that will be Ruth Hislop. Kay Anderson, your microphone is enabled. Hi, 
Hi, this is Carrie Anderson. I'm, I am a teacher, at fourth grade teacher at Robinson Elementary. Um, currently, I mean, I really do love working with the kids and having them in the classroom. It's really working um, well for those kids there. But however, um, the majority of my kids are not at school. And I have 25 kids and I average about six kids each time that kids come to school, which is only two days for one group and two days for the other group. So you can see the numbers aren't really that great. Um, it's just not working. And of course the distance learning, they're, they're hardly getting any kind of instruction and the parents are getting really frustrated with that. And they're concerns, concerned about their kids um, not being able to read and, and those sort of things. And so I kind of feel like I just, if we're gonna be in, in, in school, we all need to be there. It shouldn't be this choice. And if it's a choice right now, then obviously the numbers are saying that it's not safe. So going back to distant, going back to remote learning would be the thing to do right now until the numbers go down so that we can come back to school and everybody can attend and everybody can get the same instruction from their teachers because that's what's going to help because I have kids who actually are getting physically sick and throwing up and not coming to school or getting depressed because they can't handle it. So I really would like to see something different happen here. It's just not working. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Anderson. Next up is Ruth Hislop. And we have no one after that. Again, as a reminder, if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your digital hand. Thank you. Next up is Ruth Hislop, G. Matz. You'll be up after Ms. Hislop. Ruth Hislop, your microphone is enabled. Hello, my name is Ruthie Hislop. I've been working in the Pasco School District for 23 years, and I love the Pasco School District. Of course, I had planned to say many things before Scott Wilson spoke. So I mostly would like to say, Scott Wilson, I'm so sorry you lost your son. I also lost a daughter who took her life in 2018. I am urging every community member, whether you want to go back to school or you don't want to go back to school or whatever, please stop the stigma of mental illness. The three children that have taken their lives this year, we don't know why they took their lives. So please, can you argue any other point other than that? Because it hurts us parents who lost our children before COVID and know that that's not why they died. So I also wanted to say, I wish I could be on camera because I wanted to introduce you to Mae Fox. Mae Fox is my grandma. And if you could yeah. see her, she's gonna say hi now, but I wish you could see her. She's super beautiful community member. Her and her husband, Chester, lived here in the Tri-Cities for 40 years. And she's 94 now and lives in our home. She's going to say don't hi. Cry. Don't, don't, don't cry, baby. Can you say hi to the Pasco people? <laughs> say hi to Pasco. Oh, just say hello. Yes. Hello. And that's the reason I can't return to the building because it's not safe. It's not safe for me to bring home COVID. I have a daughter in the school district. It's not safe for her to go to school. Not right now. I'm teaching online. I'm doing a good job. I'm doing my best job. And I just urge you to really think about these things. Think about science, think about our kids' emotional needs, but also think about this. In the Pasco paper, Tri-Cities paper, December 19th, it reads, second Tri-Cities area girl dies from COVID. Deaths now total 219. People have been losing their children to suicide and it's terrible. 
Nobody lost their child to COVID until now, and there's more coming. It's Thank you, Ms. Hislop. Your two minutes is up. Uh, G. Matz, you're up next. Uh, one final reminder, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your digital hand. G. Matz, your microphone is enabled. Yes, Gloria Matz, I have worked for the Pasco School District as a school psychologist since 1992. I have an autoimmune disorder and I am not fighting off infections. Since September, the longest I have gone without an antibiotic is 10 days. I know that we cannot control our staff members' lives outside of school. I also know through TV and newspaper that they're out there shoulder to shoulder with no mask protesting. I cannot be around them. I have no guarantees that they're going to wear a mask even at school because yes, they don't do it. People are talking about how it's very rare for a child to get COVID. It's even rarer for them to pass away. Pasco School District has lost two special education students from COVID related illness. And yes, they had underlying health conditions. They were our special education students. They were loved just as much by their teachers, the paras and their parents as any other child. Are we saying they don't have the right to the same education? that we are giving every other student in Pasco? Are they going to be discriminated against based on their disability to say, you have to stay at home, but other kids can come? I think they deserve the same education as everyone else. And if that means distance learning until it's safe for all of our students to return, I really feel that's what we owe them. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Matz. Jeanette Lujan, you're next. And Rachel Stubblefield, you'll be after Mrs. Lujan. Mrs. Lujan, your microphone is enabled. Mrs. Lujan, if you can click the button on your screen that says unmute, you can begin your comment. All right, we'll move on to Rachel Stubblefield and come back to Mrs. Lujan. Rachel Stubblefield, your microphone is enabled. Thank you. Good evening, um, Superintendent Michelle Whitney and members of the board. I would like to, first of all, thank you for all the hard work and the effort that you guys have put into analyzing what is considered and always been a role of education, and now you find yourself in a health crisis. I don't envy your position, but I'm very happy uh, as a nurse here in the Pasco School District to be one of the many nurses that are all continuing to do our part to ensure the safety of our students and staff in our buildings, along with members of COVID team safety committees and district staff that are all doing, working hard to create a safe environment for our students and our staff. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this being a health crisis uh, puts us in a position of never having to take these kind of measures into account. And as one of the nurses for Pasco School District, uh, our school nurses all get together frequently to come up with ways that we can uh, help facilitate and reach out you know, across schools um, that have siblings attending other schools 
and helping the Department of Health with contact tracing. Um, we obviously are supporting Department of Health in terms of their recommendations. We're using their data and we're providing them with data as well in order to support any outcome moving forward. We know in the long run that we're hopefully gonna come back to in-person. Sorry, that was my timer for my two minutes. Am I up? You are up. Thank you, oh. Mrs. Doublefield. Mrs. Uh, Jeanette Lujan, we're gonna attempt to enable your microphone again. You able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my name is Jeanette Lujan. I'm a teacher, bilingual teacher at Robert Frost. I've been at Frost um, or in the district for 14 years and then served as a bilingual tutor many years ago. I just wanted to share that I think that we've done some things wonderfully well as a district in this crisis. I also think that we have failed our online st students. I know teachers in other districts um, that uh, have a plan really in place, a good plan in place, so that students who opted for distance learning were paired with teachers who needed to be on leave or needed to not be in the building. And I think one of the crises that we're facing right now is that we haven't taken really good care of our distance learners. The four teachers in kindergarten at Frost have all been impacted by COVID. I've lost two extended family members. One of our teachers lost um, the parent of, an, of a significant other. Um, one family, one of our teachers has had uh, children with COVID. So we've all been impacted. And because of that, and because three of us are falling into high risk categories, me because of age and two others because of underlying health concerns, we opted not to uh, bring our kids back and have 14 in a room. We opted to voluntarily um, extend our Zoom time each day with kids, which is something that was our choice, but it also increases our workload tremendously. Um, in my own class, I have 22 students, 10 have opted out, two right before Christmas, and I wouldn't be surprised if more did. I have significant concerns about remaining in the classroom. We have had children show up who have been um, tested for COVID and the parents have still sent them to school. We've averaged um, at least once a week, we haven't had any this week, we've had a child diagnosed with COVID or a staff member at our school. And I, I think we need to really be concerned about this. And one thing, and I, this probably goes without saying, I'm sure there are other teachers that have thought of this, I think that if we're willing to send our teachers back into the trenches, that we should be willing to have a school board meeting that's public, that's open to people. Um, because if you're willing to send us. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Lujan. Maria Aronio Smith is up next. After that is Heather Merlot. Maria, your microphone is enabled. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me. This is Mari Aronia Smith or Mari. Um, I'm a teacher for Pasco. I'm a parent of many teenagers. I'm also an online influencer, AKA eighth grade teacher online. Um, <laughs> so um, I wear a lot of different hats, but um, I listen to everybody's comments. And I think like um, we find ourselves in such an unusual situation where we could, a lot of us I'm sure can agree with what every single person said. So everything that everyone has said um, has merit, has value. And um, for every argument, there's a counter argument. So it's just an impossible situation where yes, everybody has concerns and everybody um, is kind of right. But um, I think there's a lot of people in the community, teachers and parents and probably school board members that can see both sides to this. Um, and I think really the answer is to give people voice and choice, um, let people choose. You know, We have people willing to teach, we have people that aren't able to. And so if we get the chance to pick our job, remote or not, if the kids can pick, if they are gonna be in person or not, um, I think we will do, it'll go a long way with our community uh, to build trust and to give people what they need right now. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to everybody because I think that you have the biggest job in the world trying to meet everybody's diverse needs. And um, I'm just proud to be a part of PASCO. 
Thank you for your comments. Mrs. Aronia Smith, Heather Merlot, you're up next. After that will be Susan Grace. Ms. Merlot, your microphone is enabled. As I'm muted. Hear me? You're un unmuted. Okay, because it came up on my screen that I was muted. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, bilingual spectrum teacher at Frost. And uh, I'm going to share something a little personal, be a little vulnerable with you here. Um, my 25-year-old daughter, who was very healthy and fit a, a few months ago, is a teacher in another state at a high school. Granted, the mitigations are not as well in place as they are here in Pasco, but you're also kidding yourselves if you think they're being 100% enforced. Um, They've had a, a huge outbreak in their school, in their very small community, and she is a COVID long hauler. She's three months later, still not back to herself and may not get back to herself. That's unknown at this time. However, she's fortunate as many she knows, students, parents, other teachers, spouses of teachers that she works with have had extended hospital stays come home, but to be on oxygen full time or they're dead. So in comparison, she's had it lucky. I've had it lucky. I haven't um, encountered such an outbreak my own self. It has terrified her. It has made her terrified that I'm in school in person because she's terrified for me to get COVID after all the suffering she has seen. I've watched a lot of almost all the board meetings since summer and I, I you, you've, you've met, there's been a lot of very blase comments about, oh, you've known people that have been COVID, gotten COVID and been, they've been fine, it's fine. People are just gonna be fine. And that is a big punch in the gut to anybody who has suffered. And uh, you really need to know that. And especially as I saw the proposed schedule for tonight or the sample schedule for extending in-person time, I, I'm just horrified. I'm horrified. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Merlot. Your two minutes is up. Susan Grace, you're up next. After that will be Patty Ann. Susan Grace, your microphone is enabled. Good evening, thank you for allowing me this time. I'm just gonna go ahead and start in on my comment. Hopefully you can hear me clearly. Um, so I just wanna mention that cases are continuing to skyrocket in our community our students, our staff safety, as well as continuity of instruction. Um, as a result of the situation, I have prepared my will, uh, including durable power of attorney and my living will. I've written to this board in the past about my situation. I'm a full-time single parent with four children of my own that depend on me. The stress of saving up my sick leave to use in case of quarantine is taking its toll. And all of these unknowns are continuing to wear down on me. Before we made this shift to hybrid, I had 100% attendance and 85% engagement with my 19 students. Since the shift, I have seven distance learners and 12 in-person learners. Attendance in person is inconsistent. This past week, I saw only eight students in person. Um, six students had to quarantine during November and December, which caused disruption to the learning. I'm asking this board to pause any changes at this time to current in-person schedules until a consistent, predictable routine can be proposed that includes a plan with educator and community input on how additional grade levels will be opened or closed in person instruction for all that is safe, accountable and transparent, PPE and necessary accommodations provided for all staff and students, daily sanitizing, a clearly communicated health and safety plan that aligns to LNI law and act access to the vaccine for all staff who want it before expanding. Every single time we change the learning schedule, families, students, and staff are scrambling to learn the new routine. Specials and interventions get changed to meet the needs of our most vulnerable learners. We lose connecting time and learning time uh, in order to learn these new routines uh, for a model that is not consistent, predictable, or sustainable. 
Hybrid learning is not a sustainable learning model that meets the needs of all our PASCO students. We must continue to put students first to make learning last a lifetime. This means a predictable, consistent, sustainable routine for robust teaching and learning that considers the needs of all, including our most vulnerable students, our English language learners, special services students, and academically at risk students. Hybrid learning is not an equitable, sustainable for our PASCO learners. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Grace. Two minutes is up. Patty Ann, you're up next, and Monica Rutter will be our last public comment. Patty Ann, your microphone is enabled. Hi, good evening. Um, I don't have anything written because I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. I just, I really feel like there are some things that need to be remembered. When we went into this, we had no idea what was going to happen. We had no idea what it was going to look like. And we did it wholeheartedly, understanding that what we had to do was what was best for our kids. We have teachers and staff who have underlying health conditions who, who are coming every day because that is what they have to do for their students and for their children. We have kids that are going home every day with symptoms or because they have family members that have symptoms and they may not be able to get tested. So we, we don't know the outcome. We just know that they are gone for 10 days at a time. We have kids that rely on us. We have teachers during distance learning who were having 40 kids show up to their classroom meetings. Now in hybrid, they have seven. We have, we have teachers that are struggling every day to get to their Zooms with their kids because they want to have as much time with their distance learning kids as they can. In the end, we have to do what's best for our kids. We love our kids. We love our district. Being in the classroom and in the building every day is amazing, but it takes a toll for those of us that know that any day one of us could get COVID. One of our kids could get COVID. One of our friends could get COVID. One of our parents could get COVID. We still show up and we do it for the kids. But for the kids, it needs to be equitable and it needs to be what's best for the kids. And I have heard both sides and I'm kind of torn because I want to be in person. I know the kids want to be in person, but I don't know that right now currently with the situation, that's the best thing for our kids. And in the end, our kids are what we do this for. And I would just really encourage you to just continue to think about that. And I don't envy your position. I mean, Thank you, Ms. Patty Ann. Your two minutes is up. Monica Rutter, you're up next and you'll be the last public comment. Uh, Mark and Board President Phillips, I can see that there's, I think, six people after Monica that have, have their hand up. So I would defer to Board President Phillips in terms of how you want to handle the six. If you want to do a last call now, how you want to kind of, but there are six people with their hands up after Monica Rutter. So Um, I think it's time to call it, um, to, to put a limit on it. So I think the six people with their hands up, should we should listen, but I think we need to cut off public comment now. Not, we want to hear your comments, please write to us if you weren't able to do that and we will be available at the next board meeting, but let's listen to the next six, the next six people. So Susie would be the last public comment then, Mark. Sounds good. Thank you. Monica Rutter, you're up next, and Julie will be after Ms. Rutter. Ms. Rutter, your microphone is enabled.
Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, as the backlash that we get as teachers, um, we get not only from, I'm sorry, I debated because of the backlash that as teachers, we get not only from parents, community members, but other teachers. It is sad that many don't feel comfortable sharing what we are facing in our homes and personally in our classrooms. Today, I'm taking a stand for many parents and teachers that feel as if they can't or shouldn't voice their valid, valid concerns and opinions. We are Pasco, somos Pasco. Isn't that what we are? Isn't that what we say? Isn't it time to not just say and act? Are we really Pasco? Somos Pasco? Or are we the Pasco that listens to only the affluential and those outspoken members in our community and teachers? I'm sad as a teacher and parent that students, that my students and my son have decided to stay at home are being left out. As a kinder teacher, I want to be in school and I want to see my students, but some have decided that it is not safe. And are we valuing their opinions and their thoughts or are we leaving them out, not including them as we are PASCO? It is hard, as a kinder teacher, it's hard to be able to meet the current guidelines of writing, of handwriting and writing even math. As teachers, we, are, we border those guidelines. And let's be honest, we break them at times in order to properly educate our students. When we break those rules in order to educate our students, our PASCO, we put our families at risk. I put my family at risk. I live in a household with two at risk or at high risk, my husband and my youngest son. I set aside those, those health concerns because I was a teacher, I am a teacher and I want to educate properly, but I don't wanna lose my life. I don't want my family to lose theirs. Our distance learners should get the same education as those in face-to-face. -face. I know this is not- Thank you for your comments, Ms. Rudder. Your two minutes is up. Julie, you are next. Linda Clavino, you'll be after Julie. Julie, your microphone is enabled. Julie, if you could click the button on your screen. Okay, you're unmuted. You can begin your comment. We're unable to hear you, Julie. We'll come back to you. Linda Clavino, you're up next. After that will be Maria. Linda Clavino, your microphone is enabled. I figured it out. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay, I get excited. Um, I wasn't planning on talking, but I want to um, chime in. And I also want to give you a huge thank you for everything. Um, many of you know that I did lose my husband to COVID and that I lost him in June. So it was pretty darn early in the whole journey. Um, some things I can tell you about it. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I also look at your dashboard and I see that you have COVID cases and you have tracking. I can tell you now with somebody who really advocated with Ben Franklin Health District and their contact tracing, it doesn't work. They're not staffed, they're not prepared. What, if I, what I've learned through this journey is in our area, well, we've done not a very good job, but I look at Pasco specifically because I live in Kennewick. So in Pasco, you have a city council member who wants to open everything. And fortunately it got shut down. I don't know what the county commissioners did. It's really, really difficult to trust that people are doing the right thing because I'm in virtual and actually succeeding, succeeding with over 200 students. I've never had that before. Um, but I'm, I'm doing it. Actually, I'm looking at a letter I got from a former teacher that 
I have her son and she is complimenting me on everything and saying for anybody who has a right to not do well, you know, it's amazing because I show up, I'm a professional, but the other piece on it is, I don't know how we, how we get back because our numbers are out, outrageous. And my students, I always ask, Hey, what'd you do last weekend? They're meeting. They're having birthday parties. They're, they're meeting all kinds of people and traveling around. And I'm not going to say anything because it's not for me to say anything, but it gives me a clue that we, we don't have a handle on it. And I don't want anybody else to have to ever experience what I've experienced and the life that I'm going to have to live now without my husband. And that's it. And I thank you and good night. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Clavino. Myra, you're next. After Myra will be Susie. Myra, your microphone is enabled. Myra, if you could push the button on your screen that says unmute, you can begin your comment. Good evening. I'm a mother of three Pasco students and an attendance clerk. And everybody's talking about their concerns in regard to coming back to the in-person learning. But I think what needs to be addressed is the availability that the teachers have for the students. Um, I'm concerned because two of my students are currently failing most of their classes. I feel like um, more Zoom time needs to be available. Tutors need to be available um, and teachers need to be available during their contracted times. Two Zooms a week for my high schoolers is just not enough. Um, if you decide that you're gonna stay remote, I'm asking that you look into um, more resources for the online learners. Because um, I talk to parents daily as an attendance clerk and I'm hearing the struggles of the students and also the frustration in the parents, you know, because they can't be home to help with homework. Um, and so I just, if you're gonna stay remote, I support that. If you go um, hybrid, I support it. But please support our online learners if you decide to stay remote. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Myra. Susie, you're up next, and our last public comment will be Julie. Susie, your microphone is enabled. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, I wasn't going to say anything either at first, but I really feel like we needed another voice for these kids for in-person learning. Um, our community is being so overrun with fear of COVID and it shows in every aspect possible. I think the science behind all of this is that COVID isn't going away. It's another strain of the flu and we're letting it, letting it run our lives and our freedoms are being taken away from us, but also our kids and school. Every day I have four kids and every day we log in, it's another disappointment and overwhelming day because they have to learn at school. Um, my two high schoolers are getting depressed more and more each day. Um, they're not learning enough online. Um, I have kids that are very involved in music. Um, I have a drummer that can't excel in drums um, because how do you do band um, sitting in your bedroom? Um, how do you sing in choir with a group of kids that you can't even uh, sing with through a Zoom call? Um, Music is a big part of many, many kids in our Pasco school district's lives and um, they're missing out because they can't be in school. I have a kindergartner that is excelling amazingly. Um, he's reading on a second grade, second grade level and he is losing interest in learning and in school. And I can only try so much to help them as a stay at home mom um, to do so much, but it's been years of course since I've been to school and I can only help them so far. Um, our kids need to be in school where they can feel thri like they're thriving. They need to see their friends. They're going to do it anyway. 
Um, and I know that Pasco School District can implement healthy ways to get us in school where these kids belong, where they need to be so that they can continue to learn the right way. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Susie. Julie, you're up next and you're our last public comment. Julie, your microphone has been enabled. Hi, thanks for taking my, my call. Um, I actually just wanted to speak because I was uh, let known that there was a petition going around by the um, union to push uh, for all remote. And so I was one of the moms and one of the concerned parents that started the counter petition that matched, pretty much has matched that in a very short amount of time for um, keeping our students at least hybrid. Um, I, you know, I have two kids in school. Um, my 12 year old started at middle in middle school. And it was really rough. Um, she, she did qualify for advanced classes and she, she had F's the first month and it was a, it was a major learning curve. And I'm sure that was for everybody. Um, she's now doing much, much better. Um, but unfortunately I can't say that for my second grader he lost half of his first grade year where the basics of phonics was taught. And so it was really frustrating um, to start this year and for him to not be able to do his homework because he can't read, he can't write. He lost those, he wasn't taught those skills. So those aren't skills that he has. Unfortunately, um, this summer we lost an office manager. And so I had to play a full-time role as an office manager and my kids were thrown into this mess. And so my voice is really for those working parents um, who can't do both in this. And so it's something just needs to be said that online schooling is not for working parents. I've had to hire two, I've had to hire a retired PS, PSD teacher to tutor my son and it just isn't enough. And it's crazy to think that I'm considering hiring a second tutor to see if we can get caught up. Currently he's reading at a kindergarten grade level um, but I, you know, I didn't go to school to be a teacher. It's not my trade. Um, I don't lack, I lack those skills to teach the phonics. We read, you know, we do those things, but there are kids that are falling so, so far behind. And they're going to continue to do that until we get back to in-person learning so that they can really have an opportunity to learn. Thank you. Thank you um, for all of those heartfelt comments. Uh, it was really good to hear your voices rather than just a letter being read. So I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to hear all of you. We will move on now to the consent agenda. We have personnel, warrants, and change order number eight at Stevens Middle School. I would entertain a motion. Madam President. To approve the consent consent agenda as presented. Second. The, I'll, I'll second the motion. I have a a motion and at least I think two seconds to um, present the to approve the consent agenda. If we could have a roll call vote, um, Mrs. Richardson. Mr. Christensen. Yes. Ms. Lincoln? Yes. Mr. Campos? Yes. Ms. Phillips? Mr. Yes. Lerman? Yes. We are moving on to our first presentation this evening that will be given by Superintendent Michelle Whitney on educating students in a COVID-19 environment. Um, an update, we'll turn the time over to her. Thank you, Board President Phillips, members of the board. It is my pleasure to be here tonight to provide an update on educating students in a COVID environment. I am going to ask some help for, from some other district office folks. So it'll be myself and some of my colleagues presenting tonight. I am gonna start off by providing the purpose. So we're really tackling tonight's meeting in three parts, two of which are informational and one where district staff will be asking for direction Public health information will be shared, most notably the governor's new proclamation and updated Washington Department of Health metric for school decision-making. 
New safety and mitigation information and approaches will be highlighted, followed by an update on our journey to dialing up in-person services. We'll be sharing a status update based on some new information from Ben Franklin Health Department, a potential path forward and some pr proposed timelines for elementary and secondary. While we are not requesting action tonight, we will be asking the board to for some discussion and direction in potential paths forward. So I did want to share with you this evening the public health data as has become kind of a tradition with our board reports. I did need to make a big caveat tonight in presenting the public health data this evening. I wanted to be really clear about a note that was on the state's website as of January 11th, encouraging caution when interpreting the data. Total case counts may include up to 1,150 duplicate and negative or duplicates and negative test results are incomplete for timeframes between November 1st or November 21st and the 30th and then December 28th to January 11th. That being said, I did go ahead and represent the Washington Department of Health data visualizations on the CDC's, what I, what I refer to as the rainbow chart, but it's the disease uh, indicators for dynamic decision-making for, for your review. So you've become accustomed as a board to seeing these, these graphics. This, the, the um, X's represent where the data that's represented on the Washington Department of Health's dashboard falls. And again, there is a caveat to where that data falls out. So on this slide, the two top court indicators are in the highest transmission. So number of new cases over 14 days and then percentage of tests in that 14 day range. I did wanna really clarify that the data on the Washington Department of Health's website has it's not 14 days for the positive test, it's only a seven day period. We also indicate whether or not we feel like we can implement all five of the strategies correctly and consistently at this point, we feel like we can. And then on this slide, the secondary indicators, there has been some improvement when you compare the current seven days to the previous seven days for cases, there could be some argument that those the improvement would be based on um, lag in reporting of data. So it would be an area that we would want to take a look at as those data points that the state calls out um, become rectified. Then the last parts on or the kind of middle core or secondary indicators are about where our health our hospital health is at. And I just also wanted to remind the board that over the last I think it was the last board meeting, maybe the last two board meetings, the way that they calculate our hospital data is different. We're now in a region of, it's called the South Central region. So it's our county plus some neighboring counties and they look at all of our health data together. And then lastly, Dr. Persons, the last time she was here talked about this existence of a localized community or public COVID outbreak. And it is a, a in, the low or no area because we don't have an outbreak in one part of our community, but we're seeing cases across the whole community. And she explained that to the board, her rationale for that during our last, our last board meeting. So I also wanted to just by way of reminder, remind the board that we had a, the Ben Franklin rec, there was a, a November 18th recommendation from Ben Franklin County Health that our that paused our approach to returning students to in-person instruction while allowing our students that were already in person to continue. So for that, it included our elementary and small groups of secondary students deemed educationally at risk. We received in December, we received or Governor Inslee issued an updated emergency proclamation that governs the closure of K-12 public schools, providing conditions and recommendations for reopening. So the updated proclamation had a heavy safety focus requiring that schools have COVID prevention plans and utilization of existing safety committees and accident prevention programs to, to ensure compliance and implementation of those designated COVID implementation plans. 
In our report tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more deeply about PASCO's approach to our safety committees. The proclamation also recommends that local school districts use the updated Washington Department of Health reopening guidance, including updated metrics. So this graphic represents the new Washington Department of Health reopening school guidance. So as part of the transition to the new metrics, school districts were not required to reduce in-person learning or revert to remote learning based on the metrics, so long as the school district demonstrated the ability to operate without transmission. So we were able, even in, within the transition, to continue the services in person to elementaries and our secondaries and small group. The really notable updates to the Washington Department of Health guidance, first the thresholds for COVID activity changed as seen by the graphics. So you can see the high, moderate, and low areas, the, the number of COVID cases that indicates that high level, moderate level, or low level changed. We, before, before the guidance, called out 75 cases of 75. Now it's um, the high is anything 350 or above, moderate is 350 to 350, and low is anything under 50. The Group size was also something notable. We were functioning under a group size of five. So small groups of five, the new guidance calls out small groups of 15, which has allowed Pasco School District to serve additional secondary students who were deemed educationally at risk. So I am gonna invite a couple of my friends to help through some highlights of safety and mitigation strategies that are new to the board. So Susana, would you like to talk about your multi-person walkthrough temperature scanners, please? Sure, thank you, Superintendent Whitney. Um, good evening, uh, President Phillips and members of the board. Um, I do get an opportunity to just give you a brief overview of our multi-person walkthrough temperature scanners. We are using uh, two of these, one at Ochoa and one at uh, Reynolds, and they are working well and we have more on order. You can see the description of how they work there on the left. So um, we're looking forward to using these. And then Sarah, if you'd like to start the discussion about school safety committees. Sure, good evening, board president, Phillips and board members. Um, as Superintendent Whitney uh, referenced a few minutes ago, uh, the updated uh, governor's proclamation um, does call for uh, uh, school safety committees to begin to participate in the uh, COVID-19 um, prevention process. All of our schools have existing safety committees um, that are were established many, many years ago per LNI rules. Um, these safety committees are inclusive. They do include um, our certificated classified and administrative staff members um, at e each work location. Um, um, and these building safety committees will now be looking at the uh, building level COVID data. Um, they will be uh, doing that uh, in order to identify any concerns that they see as a safety committee to be able to um, address those at the district or building level um, and ensure that the COVID safety prevention plans are being effectively implemented. In addition to the safety committees, we're also very pleased to see that COVID-19 vaccinations um, are being distributed to healthcare providers in our community. Um, we have created a voluntary waiting list for district staff who do wish to receive the vaccine um, so that if we are notified on short notice um, that a provider in the community has vaccine available for our staff, we would be able to mobilize that very quickly. And we currently have 530 staff on that waiting list. Um, the vaccines in the community um, are going to be uh, distributed based on uh, the Washington COVID-19 vaccine phases. And you can see that graphic here. Uh, there's a lot more information on the Department of Health website. Um, but providers do have um, the ability to offer vaccines to different populations um, within this graphic based on their own unique circumstances. And we were actually very fortunate last week um, to have um, over one 
100 staff uh, were able to receive vaccines through Lourdes um, because these were staff who, for example, work in our health rooms or our care rooms um, with our special education students, et cetera. So uh, it was a, a unique opportunity. Um, we're very appreciative um, that that um, staff were able to have this access and we're gonna continue to maintain that waiting list um, as uh, the vaccine implementation moves forward. So at our last board meeting, the district expressed intent to partner with a third party to review our COVID safety protocols and mitigation strategies. So we are currently and officially partnering with Mr. Steve Bump from Dade Moeller in our efforts to implement these safety protocols or review of our safety protocols and practices. So Mr. Bump will be critically reviewing our mitigation strategies and safety protocols, our contact tracing program and our ventilation specifications up against the latest regulatory standards, which would include guidance and mandates from Department of Health, OSPI, LNI, et cetera. This will be done through a review of protocols, through our written protocols and procedures with through interviews of staff that are tasked with implementation of those protocols and procedures, but also through the process of conducting site visits. And there's a couple of different purposes for those site visits and they differ by grade bands. So at the elementary level, it would be to review the, the current implementation of our safety plans and protocols and procedures. At the secondary, it's to review our readiness to receive in-person students in person once that decision has been made and we're able to receive more students on site. So Mr. Bump will be doing his review, doing site visitations. Site visitations start on January 19th. So the 19th, 21st and 22nd, Mr. Bump and a group of us as district staff will visit each of our elementary sites and building principals will take us on a tour, highlight the, how they're complying with the safety protocols, procedures, et cetera. And Mr. Bump will make recommendations where he sees areas that we can improve implementation and adherence to protocols and practices where our protocols and practices could be strengthened. And I'm sure there'll be commendations for areas where we are currently above standard or meeting standard or above standard. So I've met with Mr. Bump twice. He is a, a, an enthusiastic participant and we're looking forward to partnering with him he has done the same work in both Kennewick and Richland school districts and both superintendents report to me that it's been extraordinarily beneficial to their system. So I look forward to doing the same. So I'm gonna take a deep breath right there and ask the board, do you have any questions about that part of the presentation before we launch into the instructional model update? Is there anything I can clarify or highlight for you? So that was really the informational part of our presentation tonight. As we move into the instructional update, this will be a piece where obviously we're providing you some information, but we will be providing you an opportunity as a board to have some discussion. And then also we'll be asking for some direction. So as you heard tonight in the public comment, um, these are not easy decisions. And we all as district staff who have really made it our life's work to support staff and students take our responsibility in providing information to the board, in collaborating with Benton Franklin Health Department, in providing a path forward. We take it seriously and have really worked hard to analyze how we move forward together as a system from all angles of, of need. And I think it was very clear in the comments that you heard that people's needs are different. And as a system, we're going to have to get, we're going to have to double down in the way we innovate and be creative to really meet everyone's needs. And it's going to mean some heavy lifting. And it, it's, it's going to mean that we're going to need to lean into this together. So last week, the Ben Franklin Health Department approved our ability to serve lunch at our elementary campuses. And just to remind the board, that really was what was keeping us from extending the elementary amount of time on campus. So you hear about uh, our students and are we serving our students in a way that is in alignment with their needs, but also in an equitable fashion to students in the Tri-City area. We were really held to only having our students on campus for a few hours, two days a week in our AABB schedule based on our case numbers. 
because one of the mitigation strategies early on that allowed us to start was that we were not serving lunches on campus. So Ben Franklin Health District has is now allowing that. They feel comfortable given the success that we've had to this point that we would be able to look at providing lunches on campus. So preparations for this transition are beginning. Uh, district staff is currently collaborating with other Washington State school districts who have been successfully implementing meal, meals on campus. We're determining in collaboration with our building principals, determining potential need for additional staffing to enhance supervision, to ensure compliance during those lunch times with social distancing, et cetera, and preparing to deploy additional resources, cleaning, PPE. And then um, we'll be discussing with our labor partners that will need to occur before we're extending the school the school day. We have um, we've agreed as a district in our collective bargaining and agreement that we would give our association two weeks notice prior to changes. So we'll be working through that process. Extending our at or in person instruction has some unintended conse consequences and. That's really what we want to talk about. And again, it was highlighted during public comment tonight what some of those unintended consequences are. So extending the blended learning schedule. Ms. To, Whitney, oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Can, I, can I ask a question on that previous slide? Sure. Um, is it possible, I see that second bullet there that says accommodate lunch in non-classroom spaces. Does that create additional cleaning? Is there a reason, is there something that the health department says you can't serve lunch in the classroom when the children are already socially distanced at their desk? And would that reduce, is there a reason why we're, we're doing that? It's a district interest. We have an interest in exploring the ability to serve our students in non-classroom spaces to alleviate class or lunch supervision from our teachers. So this, this is really a district interest. And so that's where we wanna to start to see what can we do to do lunch service in areas that aren't classrooms, um, again, to provide some support to our teachers during the lunch time. So um, it's a district interest. I'm sorry, Scott, I can't see you on my screen. There we go. So extending, as I was saying, extending that blended learning schedule will impact the amount of time that our students or our teachers can be available for students who are choosing to be at home only. And I think one of the things that we learned from when we started to implement this blended learning model, we learned that about anywhere between 50 to 80% of our students are attending in person. And it really different, it's different, vastly different depending on which building. And again, you heard that tonight in some of the comments that teachers were making that, you know, 50% of my kids are not coming. There are schools where the majority of the kids are coming to in person. So this leaves many of our students and family that are opting for blended learning at home only. So the way that our students are being served in that model was never intended to be a long term option we really thought we would implement this modified blended learning that case counts would get better and that pretty soon we would be in a spot where we would be back full time and that parents and, and staff would feel comfortable being on campus. Well, that's not what played out. So more students than we initially thought are taking advantage of this at-home learning only option within the blended learning model. The, the model was never designed to, to, to kind of work like that. So buildings, the last time we were in front of you, we provided you some data that really showed how the attendance in person was so vastly different from each building. So we went back to our building principals who went to their teacher leadership teams and buildings have made accommodations to support our at-home learners. But it really is splitting our teachers focus between those students that are in person and those students that are at home. And again, it was never intended to be a long term educational delivery model. And we fully recognize that it is not 
sustainable and it and we need to really think about and and look at how do we serve our our families who are opting to stay home in a, a research-based best practice schedule so we and i i i wanted to highlight for the board in kind of a one pager what i'm talking about so in our blended learning model in person in the current model students are getting three hours two days a week of in-person contact with their teacher as we go to the extended day they'll get about five hours two days a week so allowing students to eat on lunch does extend their time so that um, students would be on on campus about five hours they still get 30 minutes, two days a week of virtual contact with their teacher. They get some contact with a virtual specialist, approximately 80 minutes. This varies building by building. And in the blended learning model, they don't have any contact with a virtual content specialist because they have contact with their, their teacher in person. In the blended learning at home, our blended learning at home only students are getting no in-person contact. They get 30 minutes twice a week of virtual contact with their teachers, approximately 80 minutes twice a week with contact with a virtual specialist. And just recently, we added access to a virtual content specialist where students are able to log on twice a week and get a STEM-based lesson. And then those content specialists offer office hours five days a week. This means that every second grader that is at home learning logs on with the second grade science virtual teacher and gets a virtual STEM lesson. They have the corresponding science materials at home so that they can then implement and follow through in a hands-on on lesson. Now compare that to our at home learning 2.0 approach of the fall. So the students in the fall would receive two hours, four days a week with their virtual classroom teacher. They would get that same access to specials, about 80 minutes a week. Again, that varies building by building. And then they could in this model continue to get that virtual contact with that, con that um, content specialist. So when you compare what students are getting in their current at-home learning model with what they were getting or could be getting in an at-home learning 2.0, for those students who are staying home, it was really important that we have the conversation with you about how we might best meet the needs of, of both people who are, are really valuing that in-person time and wanting to extend it, but people who are really valuing the ability to stay at home for whatever reason is for them either as a staff member or as a family. So here's a potential path forward. And every potential path forward in this COVID environment has pros and cons. And we've listed some of them here tonight that I'm gonna discuss with you. This is not an exhaustive list. It's not one that we've vetted past parents and teachers. It's one that is really just a sampling of the pros and cons to illustrate what what could happen if we choose to move forward in this way so a potential path forward that really would be an answer to providing a research-based solid approach to both in-person learning and at-home learning is to ask all parents to uh, and i'm talking about elementary we'll get to secondary but ask all elementary parents to opt in to one of three options they would be opting in to blended learning they would be opting in to at-home learning 2.0 as I described it, which is, a, which is basically the schedule from the fall with an addition of the content specialist potentially, or an IPAL program. We would ask that parents opt into one of those three options for the remainder of this school year, which would allow us then to reconfigure teaching assignments based on the expressed interest of parents. So we would know how many parents would like their students in blended learning for the remainder of the year. We would know how many parents would like their students in at-home learning. And then we could reconfigure teachers, which would allow there to be some choices for teachers as well. So the pros to this approach is it would really increase the ability for us to offer a solid research-based approach for both our in-person and at-home learners. 
it would target our teachers focus our teachers really are being asked to straddle two different models in this current environment it would offer consistency through the end of the school year it would provide opportunities additional opportunities for virtual positions it would be responsive to feedback we received from staff and parents and families who have selected at home learning would return to the schedule that was used in the fall with the potential enhancement of an additional science uh, content special. As with any option, there's pros about it, but there's also cons. So parents, we would have to ask parents to make a choice for the remainder of the school year. Restaffing and reconfiguring teachers assignments is not something we would be willing to do more than once. It's, it's gonna be hugely impact, impactful to and disruptive to people and it's intensive. So if we were going to do it, we would need to maintain those assignments through the end of the school year. Some students will be assigned a different teacher. And like I said, movement of staff and students is time intensive and it's impactful. It's, it's people who've built relationships. It's, you know, it, there's a, a true human impact to making a change. And then families may need to make some new arrangements. Again, this list was never intended to be comprehensive. It's really just a sampling of, of some potential pros and cons to this option. If we were going to move forward in this way, we've proposed a potential timeline. We would really be looking at the next few weeks or the rest of January as our approach to communicating with parents and requesting choices from our parents no later than the end of January. So we would need to know by the end of January what, is, what a parent's preference was. In order for our parents to have all the information that they need to make that decision, we would really need to be doing an intensive informational campaign, really starting right away, right up to the moment that we would be requesting them to make that choice. We would then be taking basically the month of February to first extend the elementary school day. I would anticipate being able to do that right away and at the beginning of February. Then we would, we would implement the or initiate the staffing process, communicate with parents, and then have teacher movements and preparations happen. It really would take, I mean, it sounds like that's well, like a month, it's going to take a month. We typically take four months to, to run a, a staffing process beginning to end. So um, it, it really is a heavy lift. So we would be taking the month of February to do that. And then as of March 1st, we would see those teacher, the teacher movement completed, students starting potentially with a new teacher, but it being a, a blended learning service delivery model, there would be students then that were in at home only or IPAL. These are, um, I just put these in here as a resource for the board. These are some sample blended learning schedules, what it would look like once we extend to that full day. And again, I would anticipate us being able to do that as early as February 1st. So this is for an early start school and then a late start school. So that's for the board's uh, reference and a resource for the board. So with that, I am going to take a deep breath and ask, uh, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have Jenny too and Susan who can help me answer any elementary type schedule questions but really to entertain questions from the board, allow the board to discuss. And then we'd really be looking for, what we'd be looking for from the board is really a nod saying, yes, this is an approach that we can support. And we give you the nod to move forward in collaborating and communicating about working out the logistics of this potential path forward. So with that, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I'd love to hear some discussion from the board and some ideas for direction on which way to go. First, let's first let's have some discussion. Are there any questions? Superintendent Whitney, just a quick question. Now, you're giving a choice to parents and teachers if they wanted to do. Um, uh, at school learn, in person learning and also remote learning? Right. So once parents make choices, we would know how many parents want to be in person and once how many parents want to be at home. And then that would then allow us to offer 
choices to teachers about which ones they would, which would they like to pick. Thank you. So both, yes. So thank you, Mrs. Whitney. Uh, the, the, I think this is, uh, you know, we, we heard several people express concerns about going back to school tonight. We've heard teachers, a lot of teachers, some parents, I mean, teachers are parents as well. So a lot of concern. I think this is an opportunity to address both those who want to go back to in-person learning and an opportunity for those who want to stay home and learn at home to continue doing that. So I think, I think this is a reasonable compromise. Um, a couple of, a couple of things. So, you know, you're asking them to make a choice to stick with this to the end of the year. And I, I, I think that's a fair ask because it, it is, as you explained, it's difficult when we have people shuffling back and forth. And I think what we're doing right now with the blended it's blended only, basically, and those who choose to stay home are not getting the full benefit of, of education. So those who want to can choose to stay home. I think the challenge is going to be recognizing that this is an ask to stay where you choose until the end of the year. I think it's important that that be made, that that be emphasized, that they understand that. Uh, so this blend of learning my understanding and my expectation would be that as things begin to open up, and I believe they will as we get into spring, that we'll see case rates go down and even get to the point where we can have students back in school full time. Is this, is the intent to stay blended until the end of the year or would it be to actually bring students back in four days a week or maybe five? So Steve, you, you are more optimistic than I am, and that's hard for me to say out loud because I have been the eternal optimist. So unless the restriction around the six-foot social distancing is lifted, we will have to stay in some kind of like an a ABB schedule because you can't have all your kids on campus. I am not as hopeful as you that the restriction around the six-foot social distancing will be lifted by the end of the year. Now, if it was to be lifted, then certainly we would need to reevaluate how we're serving kids and what would that mean for the schedule. I, I want to be hopeful that that's possible by June, but you know, ev at every turn, COVID has outsmarted me, so I'm learning to be um, maybe pragmatic is the right word. Um, the eternal optimist, but what is it? Prepare for the, or hope for the best, but prepare prepare, prepare for the worst. So, um, but yes, if if we were allowed to have more on site, we, we obviously would bring that to the board, et cetera, but I don't think we would, we would recommend to the board to be any more restrictive than what's required. We've, we've taken the position from, from the beginning that we've recommended the Benton Franklin Health District recommendations and we would continue to do that. Well, I would say hope for the best and prepare for the best. I mean, I think, I, I believe we're going to be there. Uh, I, so, I hope that that is the intent, is to be able to adjust and adapt and bring students back full time. So anyway, I, I think it's a good compromise that gives um, gives opportunity to both groups, those who want to go back and those who don't. So I, I like it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. COVID's been a dream crusher for me, Steve. I'm, I'm, thank you for the reminder. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to say thank you for the work as we've heard in the public comment today, and as we've heard for months, there's people on both sides of this coin, those who want people, want their kids back in school as many hours a day as they can be, those who don't want their kids uh, in, in public, in schools at all. And as we heard, you know, people, we've been listening to the voice, people want the choice. This is a, a good compromise, I think. I. I think it gets us closer to what Kennewick and Richland are, are giving opportunistically wise for hours um, for elementary school kids that choose to go in person per week. Um, I, I do like the ABAB, we, we beat that dead horse into the ground. And I do see benefits here, uh, transportation wise, you know, to only be busing one set of, of students per day. So um, 
looking at all sides of it, I think it's a good compromise and I think it, it gives more choice and more opportunities and more hours of instruction to all students as we can see there, those who choose the fully at home option and those who choose the blended learning, it looks like they're all gonna get um, more teacher contact time than they're getting now. So um, thank you. I agree. I think that this gives the best option for both parents and teachers um, that and that we can get our students back into the classroom for more time for those that want to let their kids go into the classroom and those that want to keep their kids at home. So I think this is the best option and that we can get it done as soon as possible. And I, I thank you for all your hard work. A team effort. It's it's been a community lift and a community impact. So I'm proud to represent the work. I do think it's a it's a good choice, um, given the the choices um, for the parents, as well as teachers. And hopefully, every teacher gets to, to choose um, if they would want to um, be at home and teach from home or be in person. Um, it's important to, for, for that to and that flexibility to happen. Um, we are here for the kids and also our staff, and um, I think that's that's a, a fair shake. They can they can choose which way they want to do it, um, and hopefully we can get into school like regular sooner than later. No, I I appreciate the feedback, and it feels like there's a consensus nod to from the board for district staff to continue to move down down this direction. I do want to point out and just be really clear, we started down this path initially in November when we started to bring back elementary. And we heard from people the tension around losing their students or losing their teacher was a, a was problematic for people. So we backed away from this idea in November. So I just really want to be clear that I fully recognize that what we're asking our staff and community to endure and, and to partner with us on is an impact. And if we felt like we could move forward in a different way and do right by everyone, we would be doing that. But at this point, we feel like this is the best option to meet people's needs. So we, you know, it is, it is not lost on me that every time we make one of these, these changes, the impact on a teacher, the impact on a family, and, you know, as this goes on and on, people's resiliency window to deal with the changes becomes more and more narrow. So I just want to recognize that and once again, say how proud I am to be a part of a community that is enduring the most complicated set of circumstances I've seen in my lifetime and that I, I ever hope to see again. I hope this was a one time in 47 years and like when we're on the other side of this, we can celebrate being stronger for having participated. So um, thank you for that. So if it's okay with, oh, Amy? Yes, I, yeah, I, I too want to express appreciation. There was lots of people the, um, from the comments that, that did express the lack of learning that we have for our, at, our, for our remote learners right now. And it's been a real concern. And, and like we said it, that was never our intention. It was supposed to be different than this. In this COVID environment, you know, I appreciate that this district's doing the best they can um, and the board, the school board's doing the best they can with what information we have at the time. I do, um, I do really appreciate all of the, all of the comments. I, I really, it, this really kind of hit me really hard when Maria or Oronia Smith said, a lot of us can agree with ev what every single person has said and I thought, you know, that is so true. I mean, I got teary-eyed through several of those those presentations. We can, we can agree. And as a board and as a district, we are trying to serve all of our students and families and teachers. And so allowing choice, I do feel like is the best way to do it. And it is going to change how we do things. And we are going to have to make some shifts in teachers because our remote kids are going to have to have a remote teacher. And hopefully there will be enough choice for the teachers who want to stay home and do that. Um, I do want to ask a little bit more about the timeline of going back. Um, the 1st of February to get the kids into later um, 
excuse me, the first of February to get the kid, the elementary school kids in at lunch. Well, one thing about lunch that I wanted to ask, will Dade Muller, who's doing that safety sort of audit or however you want to call that, will he also be going over the information to make sure our lunches um, at our elementary schools are safe? Yes. Great. I just think that's a fantastic idea. One of the great benefits of working with an outside third party like that who has access to lots of different organizations and he does safety audits for school districts, but he, he you know, safety is their, their work. And so, um, yes, he'll be able to help us with that. So I'm, I'm excited about it as well. Good, good. I'm glad. It would be really nice for the teachers to be able to have that time to, to do what they need to if we can keep our kids safe. So I'm grateful he's going to be in on that. Not that I doubt your help because I know that um, you guys are doing your best, but it's nice to have an expert. Um, and then I would like to look into the timeline a little bit. So elementary, first of February, middle and high school. Yeah, we'll talk about secondary next. So if you're ready to move on to secondary, I'm happy Perfect. to do that. I have my, my friend, Dr. Rodriguez, help me with secondary. Perfect. I, I, if I missed something, so thank you. I just, I just wanted to make one, one more comment as I think about, you know, the different perspectives from everybody that, that makes comments either in emails to us or via the public comment that we have in these board meetings. Um, you know, some people reference science and it goes both ways as, what, as to whether we should be fully at home or fully at school. And I personally respect this virus. We don't know, like many people said, how it can impact people. We heard from somebody who had 20, Ms. Glavino's 25 year old daughter who had, was in good health and had serious impacts from it. Mr. Mr. Merlot. Oh, okay. And I have, you know, I have, and, I, and this is not to be flippant about it at all. It's just to point out that we don't know how it impacts people. I have two grandmothers, one's 97 in Idaho. She has Alzheimer's, can't remember, is probably walking around her, her um, home without her mask and she got COVID. Didn't even know she had it, couldn't remember that she had it from five minutes to the next. And and, and came through that and my other grandmother is 94 years old in another home and got COVID. So people who are old can get it and not have bad impacts. People who are children who are in great health can have serious impacts. And so it, I, it just, when we hear people say that people aren't respecting the mask or the social distancing in the workplace or in the schools, I hope that everyone can be their, their brother's keeper and ensure that they respect the others, um, even if they don't fully believe in what a mask can do and what social distancing can do when we're, when we're in the Pasco School District, I hope that, that that's not a common occurrence because there's other people that, that do believe that the social distancing and the mask will keep us safe. And until we see outbreaks, um, I guess we as a board believe that the, that the safety mitigation and measures that we're taking are going to be effective as long as people adhere to them. So I hope those comments that we heard are, are not rampant through the schools. And I, I have to believe they're not until we hear otherwise as a board, but I hope that everyone just shows respect to others in, in making this work for all of us so that we don't have to shut it down. Well, and one of the pieces I think that will be really beneficial from the government governor's proclamation is the requirement that our school-based safety committees are involved in monitoring compliance to your COVID safety protocols. So it, it was a, a serendipitous that we already have safety teams. I've always said those closest to the work are teacher experts. They know best what needs to happen. So I think engaging those safety teams will really get to your point, Scott, around um, safety and compliance. And so I'm excited about the work that those safety teams are going to do. So with that, uh, President Phillips, if you're ready, we can move on to secondary. Certainly we can always come back and talk more about elementary should you need to, but we can move on to secondary. And I would turn that over then to Dr. Jenny Rodriguez. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Phillips, members of our board, Superintendent Whitney. I appreciate having just a few moments to talk with you uh, on an update with secondary status of education and what we're looking at for models at that level as well. I know you're anxious to see the timeline, but I want to go over just a little background first, and then we'll take a look at those timelines. We did receive verbal recommendation from our local health department yesterday, um, and we're expecting to have a new written recommendation sometime later this week. 
we are expecting that that's going to state that we can begin a phased in return of secondary students as early as January 25th. So we're still a couple of weeks out from that initial potential start date. We do have several key considerations for a transition at the secondary level that are different and unique compared to our elementary counterparts. The number of students on our secondary campuses are substantially higher than they are at our elementary schools. And that can have some potential impacts to the successful implementation of all of our mitigation strategies. The ability to maintain cohorts of students when students have multiple teachers, multiple classes is more challenging at the secondary level as well. We also having those larger numbers of students could have potentially a higher impact on our district and local health department contact tracing efforts should cases occur. We are looking at, just as we've talked about tonight with elementary, how do we balance the needs of students who want to return to in-person instruction with those who wish to remain fully at home? So we are looking at options there as well. At the high school level, we have, I would say the most complex set of challenges because we have so many specialized courses and specialized teachers. There are many courses that are offered one period a day by one staff member and so trying to clone all of our teachers and, and have them do things in a double way is, is very challenging. We also have some real challenges around the timing of transition and you've heard us talk before about the natural break at trimester. We have at the high school credit bearing coursework that puts kids on the path for on time graduation so it's critical not to have disruptions uh, to that to that pathway. I also want to take just a moment to give you a very short athletics and activities update with Governor Inslee's Healthy Washington Roadmap to Recovery last week. We've had additional updates from the WIAA following that at the middle of last week. We are anticipating that we would be able to resume middle school athletics when middle school students transition back to being on campus. So that timeline is going to come into play with athletics as well. For high school, we do plan to continue high school athletics as permitted under um, state rules. We are looking at now a fall season rather than a winter season to kick off our athletics this year. And it is scheduled at this time to begin February 1st. We are prepared and plan to be um, open and ready to do that. It is important to note that the WIAA uh, continues to provide updated guidance. They are scheduled to meet again next Tuesday, January 19th to talk about season two and season three. So we are expecting to have additional updates from them next week so we'll be keeping you up to date on that so at, just at a high level can i ask a question on that um i understand the high school athletics part of it the middle school athletics part of it if we if those kids go back to blended learning in march or april i would assume it also be would it be a fall season as well for those middle school students so we have season dates set for the middle school. It is um, the layer of complexity at middle school is that we have four separate athletic seasons rather than three, which is really a result of capacity space at middle schools, not just in our district, but really across the state. We also um, have reached some agreements with middle schools within our local region that really at the middle school level, we're gonna keep things embedded within district for this year because of all the challenges. So we had already scheduled to have our winter one season. Um, so those dates have already come and gone. Our next season is scheduled to start February 8th. And originally we had planned to do winter two followed by fall and then spring. So we are waiting for that state WIAA high school guidance to help inform our decision about which sports should be offered during season two, three and four at the middle level. So. Once we have that information on high school, which really is driven at a state level, we'll be able to do our best to align the middle school program to that. Thank you. We did break out a separate timeline for middle and high school. One of the things that BFHD shared with us yesterday is that they really do support a staggered approach to bringing back our secondary students. They are not recommending that we would Pull the trigger on 6 through 12 at the exact same time. So we wanted to really think about how to lay out, uh, given what you saw tonight around recommendations for an elementary timeline, to allow for that stair-stepped progression and bringing back our secondary students. 
you can see here, this graphic looks very similar to the one we looked at for elementary. So we are waiting again for that written guidance. We'll review it immediately upon receipt. We do need to very quickly identify the program options that would be offered for middle school students and families. And we anticipate being able to do that fairly quickly then communicate with parents and request choices by February 5th. So in comparison, we would be asking elementary families to make a decision no later than January 29th. We've given just one additional week for parents to make a decision on middle school. Um, obviously, we would continue to communicate, collaborate, and bargain with our labor partners throughout this entire process. Because we're starting just a week later, you can see the implementation in terms of that staffing process and communicating teacher reassignment should they be necessary. That is still scheduled to happen in February. So our goal really would be to be able to start some middle school students um, at the same time as elementaries are fully transitioning into this new model. So beginning March 1st, we would be looking at hopefully having our sixth grade students back on site. They would be opting in again, as we talked about for the remainder of the year into one of the offered models. We are anticipating they would be the same options that we talked about this evening for elementary. So that would be students and families opting into a blended learning where they're going to be on site two days a week, an at-home learning, which would look like the schedules from the fall or IPAL full-time. So that's what we anticipate, but we haven't yet made that decision. Sixth grade would begin first and we would follow very quickly. Our intent would be to follow really the following week with our seventh and eighth grade students. And so we would have all of them back on site before the transition to trimester three. So that's what our middle school proposed timeline looks like. Dr. Rodriguez, I'd, I'd like to make a request on the last two bullets there. We know that transitions are difficult for all these kids and this year's a special year, not only in COVID in that our seventh graders would be going to the middle school for the first time. So they're more in line with the sixth grade in needing maybe to be at the school for an extra week with your kids there. Um, and if we're cohorting similar, if we're only having half of a grade, you know, half of the school there at a given time, if we were able to put sixth and seventh grades there um, as part of the transition that first week, we'd still, I believe, have less than half of the capacity at the school, but help ease them in with the transition instead of bringing them in with the eighth graders. Yeah, I appreciate that point, Mr. Lehrman, and we absolutely can look at that option. I'll also walk you just briefly through a proposed timeline for the high school level. So again, um, we'll review the written guidance as soon as we receive that from our local health department. At the high school level, given the challenges of those singleton courses and specialization of teachers, we are going to continue to explore a split day schedule to maintain in person and at home instruction within the existing high school student and teacher schedules and day. Um, we will need to see if that will be feasible and then identify the final program choices that would be offered to families, given that that work requires um, some additional conversation with a number of stakeholders. We are anticipating we would need just a little bit longer to identify those program options and we want to ensure families have that same window of time to make their final decision. So we would be asking families to commit to their choice no later than February 12th. This is again just one week later than middle school, which was one week later than elementary school. We would then follow by initiating any staffing process that may be necessary for families who may be choosing to opt into IPAL full time at that point. Um, we do have a, a process that was very supportive. Our IPAL team is amazing. They do a great job and they do intake meetings individually with each student and family. So that takes some time and we would anticipate needing some time to get them ready in advance of the trimester transition so that they can hit the ground running right away. Obviously, again, continuing to communicate with parents. Our target dates then really would be to shift to this new um, model options at the beginning of trimester three, which is March 15th. This is just one week after we would have returned the last of our middle school students. So it is a very fast stair step transition for our secondary schools over a three week time period. We would recommend starting the first week with ninth graders on site and then adding our upperclassmen the following week. So you would see all of our students who want to do an in person program uh, K 12 as of March 22nd, they would all be there. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
Board President Phillips, before you go into discussion, I did want to point out a couple things. One, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow is my Superintendent Student Advisory Council meeting, and the student board representatives and, and I planned to have Dr. Rodriguez join us where we're gonna talk on talk about a number of secondary specific issues. One is, do I turn my camera on or not? Um, so that's a, will be a, an interesting conversation. But the, but the other piece is around this transition back to campus and, you know, the choices between in-person and at home and the, the timing of transition. So we're gonna spend some time talking to our stu superintendent student advisory council, but in collaboration with our student board representatives, we may be seeing some surveying of our high school students um, come, come out of that discussion. So we'll keep you posted on the outcomes of the superintendent student advisory council meeting tomorrow, but I did want you to know that we are talking to the superintendent student advisory council tomorrow about exactly this board presentation. So just so you're aware, I also wanted to let the board know and district staff know that at 453, we did get the written recommendation from the health department. I have not had time to review it, but um, it has been forwarded to district staff for their review. So I'm sure that people will be digging into that tonight or first thing in the morning. So with that, um, President Phillips, we would entertain questions and then I would defer to you for discussion and direction. Any questions from the board about this high school, middle school transition? Um, I guess I do, I have some questions. I am a little concerned about the timeline. Um, I just, we, I feel like it's feasible to get our elementary schools back on, and hopefully February 1st, that's a Monday. Um, that I, I just think that would be ideal, but I am concerned about getting our middle school and high school students. I also understand the, how much easier it would be to get them back at trimester break. Uh, I also realize that near the, or what is the halfway mark? I think it's mid, mid January. We are halfway through school. And if we don't get our kids back until, you know, the third week in, in March, we are now two thirds of the way instead of halfway. We just lost so much schooling, our middle school and high school kids. I really feel like that the ones that need to be back need to be back. And I don't know how to go about doing that. And I don't know if we can work that out, but I feel really strongly that we need to move that, that process forward if we can do that and, and get these kids back. I would love to see the middle school transition begin mid-February and, um, and the high school, you know, near the end of February, if at all possible. But I, I realize your job is hard. I realize this is difficult, but I would really like to, to up that timeline. I, I appreciate all the work and, and these options that have, have been presented. I would, uh, I'd echo some of what Ms. Phillips said. I think that I, I guess I, the middle school schedule, the middle school return um, looks good. The high school, I, I guess I'd like to see also maybe a stretch goal to try and get the high schoolers back by the beginning of March. Just looking at it because we're going to bring the ninth graders back for one week. If we go on this schedule here, they're going to the 10th through 10th through 12th graders are going to come back. I think it said the 22nd of of March, they're going to probably go to school for a week or maybe two. I haven't looked at the schedule for this year, and then it's going to be spring break, and then we're a week into April, and we have what seven weeks, seven eight weeks left of school for a lot of these kids. So, um, if there's any way to to stretch goal for a, a start at the beginning of uh, March for the high school, I, I'd like to see that. Do we, do we know yet what Richland and Kennewick are doing with their high school students? Richland's board meeting is tonight and uh, Kennewick has a business meeting scheduled tomorrow. So we'll know by Thursday what, <laughs> what all three local school districts are doing. Not that we're gonna do what they're doing, but, but it, it would be interesting to know. 
And I, I caveat what I say when I say stretch goal with that high school in March. I fully understand what a heavy lift this is. All three grade levels for district staff, teachers, changes, transitions for everybody. So if you guys looked at it a little more and told us, you know, this is this is already a stretch goal, what we've, what we've proposed, I fully understand that. I appreciate both of your feedback. I think um, at the at the high school level, it will depend on what we are able to determine will be the options for families. Some options would be able to be implemented more quickly than others. If we are going to pursue something that looks more like the elementary and middle school recommendations where people are opting out and we're having to reassign all classes and all teachers that is an extremely heavy lift at the high school level. And in addition, when we're talking about credit bearing coursework that counts towards graduation, having many, many students change teachers midstream has some real potential for harm academically to students staying on track for graduation. So I, I appreciate the feedback and we will do our very best to have students back sooner if we were able to do so. It may depend on the final options that we're able to offer to families at the high school level. So, so I have a question related to offering options at the, at the high school level in particular. Um, I know I was thinking through it like we wanna give choice. Some people can stay at home, fully at home. Some people can be part of this blended model. And I was thinking, well, is there a way to, to Zoom or to actually um, give your content level to people at home, well, the same content that those in school are getting, you know, either live or record it and allow other students to watch it. I was thinking, yeah, that'd probably be hard at the elementary school level. The teachers move around a little bit more and sometimes you got to move to keep the elementary school level or elementary school students attention. But high school is more like a college type setting. The, the kids are more adult. Is there a way to implement um, those who want to come in person also either recording or streaming via Zoom or Teams or whatever platform we use um, simultaneously? Has that option been looked at? And is it a t if, if it's not been looked at, can we look at it? If it has been looked at, what are the limitations on why it can't be done? Is it a technology limitation that we have? Is it a different limitation? And maybe you don't have the answer now, but I'd be interested in that. We have looked at that option, Mr. Lehrman. Um, I do not think that technology is necessarily a barrier, although it could cost us some money uh, to make that work. The bigger concern really is that that's not really a research-based instructional model to have the engagement happening in person with students. Um, even at the high school level, there's a lot of discussion. Teachers do move about the room. Um, they may be doing a variety of activities, even in our current environment. And for a student who's at home, while they could watch it, like they watch a TV show, um, it's not gonna result in the same kind of engagement or opportunity to engage with their peers and their teacher as a, as a fully virtual meeting where teachers have really planned and structured the learning to occur in this format like we're doing tonight over a Zoom. So we have looked at that option, um, but we haven't pursued it deeply because we felt like there's probably a better way to support our at-home learners. So we really are truly looking at options where courses could be offered in person part of the day and offered again virtually um, at, a, at another time of day. And so that students would have access to that same learning either in person or over Zoom with the dedicated teacher focused on that model at that time. So I think that is our hope, but we are continuing to work through what that option might look like for our high school students, families, and staff. Thank you. I've got just a couple of comments. So again, thank you for the work. I, I am just thinking about these timelines here. So right now, I think the one that's suffering most is probably our elementary level because they're the ones that are doing the blended people staying home. The middle school and high school are are all on the same program. I mean, it's all remote learning. So, I, I mean, if it takes the time to get her right, uh, I would certainly like to be there by trimester. I mean, that's two months away. So, uh, but 
even advancing the elementary rather than waiting till March. Anything we could do to advance that to get those students back in their stable learning environment, I think, would be a benefit. So, I also want to just give a plug for IPAL here. So, uh, those who are not familiar with IPAL, I'm not going to say I'm an IPAL expert, but the way I look at it is IPAL is is regular school. I mean, if you feel like you are struggling in this environment with either remote learning or blended learning, it's not consistent for you or whatever the case might be, maybe IPAL is an option. Uh, the thing about IPAL is it's an, it's an independent study course, as I understand it, and certainly you guys can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but, but uh, you have to be fairly motivated, you have to have parents that will keep you on track, but it is a good learning model for those who work independently. So don't, don't uh, discount that if you're really concerned about your education this year and you want something that's more consistent, you can go to IPAL and it's available for all grade levels, I believe. It is available for all grade levels. I really appreciate that plug, Mr. Christensen. I just would give a shout out to our director of our IPAL program, Deb Thurston and her team. We've expanded the staffing at IPAL by about 600% this year. So they are doing an amazing job they are very dedicated to connecting with families who choose that for their, their option. Um, we have dedicated teachers by grade level for each elementary level. Um, we have dedicated content teachers at the middle school level. Our high school IPAL program is a little bit different in that it's taught by high school teachers from the high school campuses and they, they do that almost like an adjunct would at a community college. Um, but for our K8 student, K students, it, it tr it's the like full meal deal is kind of how we describe it. Um, and it is a wonderful, amazing program. So particularly for families who are interested in um, jumping into, if they, if you know that you want to be at home for the remainder of the year, I really encourage you to explore that as an option. Are we gonna hear from our uh, student reps tonight? Um, as far as the timeline, um, I would have to agree with uh, President Phillips just about it really feeling like a far long way to be able to say that we're going to start in March. And I know um, as the board reps and um, Whitney, we discussed having a question on the survey asking kids if they felt comfortable starting in the transition of the new trimester or if they would like to start before just because some kids might need help, especially during those finals weeks. As the trimester ends, it's helpful to get um, help. Um, I did um, wanna ask about the guidances and kind of the restrictions for allowing students to go back to class, just to those certain teachers they need to see. For example, if they need to see a counselor, I know for seniors, I had a hard time doing stuff and not being able to contact my advisor in person. So if that's something that's allowed to happen, or kids that need to see their advisors or organization teachers to help them with what they're going through right now. Because I know for us as DECA members, we had competition and we had to do it over Zoom and we had no idea how to do our links or record videos, so. Thank you for that feedback, Krista. Um, again, we'll, we will continue to look at what we can do with the timelines based on the models we, we end up with. Um, we are serving more students considered at risk at the secondary level. So I just really encourage you, the students you know, and any students who are tuning in, please reach out to your school counselor, your teachers, your school principal and assistant principals. We have a whole process by which students can be scheduled to come in for a one-time appointment if needed or for an ongoing schedule of tutoring. Um, we have students who come one day a week, every week, students who come two days a week, students who come to campus to just have a reliable place to have internet and ensure that they can log into their Zoom calls. So there are many options that are, that are currently happening and um, please just ask. There are many, many people at the high schools who are there to help you with what you need. So unless there's any other questions, clarifications, or direction you as a board would like to give district staff, this concludes this presentation. We do have a 
follow up on the Open Public Meetings Act and the student board representatives have reports tonight as well. So um, is there any other questions, discussion or direction about educating students in a COVID environment? Michelle and Brees, I don't see Brees. Oh, there you are. Um, you, you've changed positions on my screen. Do you guys have any comments? This is directly affecting you and this is where we really love having your comments available. And remember, you don't have to agree with each other. We, we want you to, to let us know how you feel. Um, well, I agree with Krista with what she said, and I think that tomorrow um, when we do have the meeting with the Student Advisory Council, we're going to have a better image about what the majority of our students believe, and I think that that student survey is going to help and direct us um, in a better way because it's one thing about what parents and what teachers want, but it's also about like what the students want and what they feel is most comfortable for them and their learning environment, so I think that's what's going to determine a lot of it. I agree with both of them. I think that uh, the timeline's a little far. Like I would prefer if we could get back before trimester three, but also hearing tomorrow what this other student um, reps with a uh, student advisory council would say about this, I think is very important. So I think um, tomorrow, once we get all that data, we could bring it in here and that would Those are really wise words and you're right. It's good to hear hear what the students want as well. Um, so we will continue. Thank you for speaking to our student reps. We'll continue with um, item number B, the Open Public Meetings Act update that will be given by um, Mrs. Thornton. Thank you, Board President Phillips. Uh, good evening again, members of the board and Superintendent Whitney. Uh, the purpose of this uh, presentation for you tonight is, give you, is to give you a brief update on the uh, changes to the Open Public Meetings Act that have occurred during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, and so we're we're going to start with the end in mind um, because as you'll see here in a minute, um, the, the way that the changes and the options for the board, the way that that's playing out gets a little bit complicated once you, once you uh, scratch the surface. So I, I'd like to start with, with the end in mind and, and just give you two key um, takeaways to keep in mind as I, as I walk through some more of this information. Um, the first is that the board is still required to hold remote meetings. The board is not allowed to hold by law, is not allowed right now to hold in-person meetings. Um, I know that um, you as board members and we as staff have received a number of questions about that. Why isn't the board meeting um, in person if kids are starting to go back to school? And in fact, I believe Ms. Lujan referred to that question even during her comments tonight. Um, and this is the reason that um, there is a proclamation in place that's been in place since the end of March that specifically prohibits public agencies from meeting in person. Um, if you want to conduct business, you have to do it remotely through a remote meeting. And I'll talk a little bit about what those requirements are. So that is still in place through at least January 19th. So that's key point one. Key point two is there is an in-person component that could be an option for the board in future meetings once business meetings are allowed again. And so I'll talk about why that is, but, but those are really the two key takeaways. Still no public meetings and we are looking potentially at an in-person option. So just a very brief um, refresher for you. Um, when I talk about the OPMA tonight, what I'm talking about is the Open Public Meetings Act. This is the law in the state of Washington that governs public meetings um, of all public agencies, including school boards. So uh, when you as a board meet and when you take action, um, in order for those um, actions to be valid and have any effect, they have to be, your meeting has to be in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, if, if they're not, then they're null and void. And so what has happened is since the end of March, certain requirements 
in the Open Public Meetings Act have been modified or suspended. And so in order for the board or any other public agency in Washington to um, continue to conduct business as a board, you have had to move to remote meetings because to, to not do that would um, basically leave you unable to, to act. You, you'd be unable to pay the bills, which is something that you do pretty much at every public meeting. So this has been a requirement and this has been the reality that, that you as a board have been living under since the end of March. So the, um, with that prohibition, like I said earlier, that um, is extended at least through January 19th of 2021. Um, I do expect, and I believe other um, agency counsel around the state also expect that that would be extended beyond the 19th, um, but we don't know that for sure yet. So at least through the 19th of January, um, in-person public meetings are prohibited. You have to meet remotely. In December, on December 8th, um, a, an option was added to that in-person meeting requirement. An option was added that would allow you, um, under certain circumstances, to add an in-person component to your public meeting. And, and that in-person component uh, would, have to meet, um, would have to meet certain requirements. The requirements that the in-person component of your public meeting um, would have to meet um, become a bit complicated as we dig into it. Um, there are certain elements of the remote meeting that you would have to continue. So the remote meeting would have to um, allow people who were to or allow people rather to remotely access the meeting at a minimum by telephone but also through the internet or other means so we're complying with that tonight by allowing people to phone in to the zoom meeting um, people can also see the meeting being live streamed over youtube those um, two steps are both to bring us in compliance with that requirement um, the other key requirement for remote meetings is that um, the meeting attendees, whoever is, is watching the meeting or is listening to the meeting by phone, they have to be able to hear the meeting as it's happening. Um, so, so the meeting can't be held, recorded, and posted for people to see. People actually have to be able to see the board um, doing their business as it is happening. So, so even with this new additional in-person component as an option, those requirements of remote meetings are still in effect. The board is still required to hold remote meetings. If the board decides that they do want to add an in-person component, there are additional requirements that the in-person component would require. Um, the public would have to be able to attend the meeting if they wanted to attend in person, they'd have to be able to attend it either at the primary or overflow location. Um, they'd also have to be able to access the meeting as it was happening. Um, and we would have to provide devices for members of the public to be able to both listen and speak if they wanted to participate. So those are um, some of the requirements. In addition to those requirements, but wait, there's more, the agency or the board in this case would also have to comply with the requirements for business meetings, which are contained in a different governor's proclamation under the miscellaneous venues requirement. Um, and there are a, a whole host of requirements there that relate to meeting room capacity, 
they relate to requiring um, people who attend the meeting to wear face coverings and maintain distance, and also that there would be a COVID-19 supervisor, a district staff member, who would be appointed and designated to, um, to monitor that and to enforce that. Um, and so the, the in-person component requirements then indicate that if the if any of those um, if any of those elements are not in compliance during the in-person or in the the in-person meeting then the meeting would have to stop or be adjourned if, if any of those elements are out of compliance so so what that would look like is the board would be holding its meeting remotely kind of as we're doing now um, and there could be um, you know, an, an in-person component to the meeting where members of the public could attend, say here at the booth building, if somehow the equipment went down in that room, or if there was an issue with one of the attendees not being in compliance with the mask or distancing requirements or something, the COVID supervisor would have to notify us. We would have to um, either stop the meeting until compliance was achieved or we'd have to adjourn the meeting. Um, being out of compliance in that sense would basically put the board out of compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act legally and would put board action at that meeting in jeopardy. So um, there, are, there are a lot of different aspects that the board would need to consider. Um, and, and again, like I said, it, it gets complicated as you start digging into the, the miscellaneous venues requirement. Um, so again, to summarize, remote meetings only through at least January 19th, this in-person component could be an option if the board wanted to do it for future meetings, but that will only be an option once business meetings are allowed. Currently, business meetings um, are not allowed in phase one. Uh, there's some complexity around the way that this guidance has been rolled out. So we're not able at this point to say specifically at what on what date um, our region would move into a phase that would allow those in-person meetings. We'll continue to monitor that and keep the board updated. Right now, that's not an option, but it could be at a future meeting. So... Um, our next steps, uh, there are legal ramifications, um, as I um, mentioned very briefly, um, specific legal ramifications um, of compliance and enforcement um, that I would like the opportunity to discuss with the board further in executive, in executive session prior to uh, the board making a decision on whether you want to go with um, or, or add a public um, in-person component. Um, as I said, board meetings will still be required to be held remotely. Um, we'd also need to look at staffing considerations for technical support and enforcement um, at the in-person component of the meeting um, and business considerations if the meeting did need to be um, suspended or adjourned due to non-compliance. Um, this is ultimately the board's option. It's a board decision. Um, and so if this is something that the board wants to pursue, um, it would be scheduled for board action in the future. So that's what I had for you. Um, any questions or discussion? Thank you for that. Yeah, I guess we we did have that comment earlier asking um, why we weren't meeting like you alluded to in public. And thank you for summarizing that it's not legal for us to do that now. So I think I, I just want to summarize what I understand and correct me any points I'm wrong. We, we could take action, I mean, in the near future. But even if we did, we still have to wait until we get past phase one and until business meetings are allowed. And at that point, it sounds like we check 
Um, technology wise, we checked that box even before COVID started. We have a uh, live stream and we have um, open meetings in the booth building, but there's a, a limitation on the number of people. I think um, you'd given us some additional information. I think you said 25% of capacity. Looking at tonight's board meeting, which was of high interest to many people, I think I saw at our peak, we were at about 80, 80 attendees, including us. Not all of those people would want to come in person, but what is our capacity in our boardroom at this time, 25% uh, of it? So Scott, the uh, fire marshal capacity of the boardroom is 257 people, which a little bit blew my mind because I'm sitting in the boardroom trying to imagine 257 people in here. Um, so 25% of that, you know, like 64 people. I, I have a hard time imagining 64 people in here six foot apart. So, um, but I, I did want to be ready for that because I knew that you were curious about the capacity of this room. Can you guys, can you guys do some calcs and measure it out for if we, if we decide not to go forward with it now, but when it is legal so that we understand how many people would be allowed in the, in the actual boardroom without having to go to a contingency seating area? Yeah, I'll have Susan and Steve work on coming up with COVID calculation for this room. And then also some additional rooms that we could use as overflow so that we have that for your consideration. Thank you. And Scott, just to touch on your, your point about the, the business meeting requirement, you, your understanding is correct that um, we would not be allowed to do this um, until business meetings were allowed. Um, and that has been previously a um, dependent on the phase of reopening that the county was in. Now we've moved to um, a regional framework um, and we would expect that the same phase, a phased approach would also apply to business meetings moving forward. And, and that terminology business meetings, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't just mean any business that that corresponds to publicly elected officials holding meetings of the public under OPMA. So when we say business, is it is the interpretation that no businesses should be holding large meetings or is that just the OPMA um, interpretation for public meetings? It is actually the it is actually business meetings as are referenced in the miscellaneous venues guidance um, that is attached to Proclamation 2025. So in Washington, there is a laundry list of requirements for different types of businesses and venues across the state. Um, and it is kind of a bowl of spaghetti as far as what specific requirements apply to different businesses. So for example, they, the um, gyms and restaurants and um, you know, retail establishments and that type of thing. There is a category on that laundry list, there is a category that is designated as quote unquote miscellaneous venues and there is a description of activity business meetings at those miscellaneous venues. So you've got to drill down really to, to a very, very narrow focus there. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we say business meetings. So it's in separate guidance. What is a miscellaneous venue? And let me ask it a different way. If district staff wanted to meet, follow a social distancing protocol, and there was 15 booth, booth, uh, district staff that wanted to meet with social distancing and masks. They're not, they're not under the OPMA guidance. That's not considered a business meeting, is it? It's not under this particular definition because they're not working in a miscellaneous venue. They're working mm -hmm. in a school building or a district office. But for this particular purpose of deciding whether a public agency can hold an in-person component, um, the state made the decision to tie it 
to these miscellaneous venues business meeting requirements. Is the booth building a miscellaneous miscellaneous building miscellaneous building during a board meeting? Probably not. It would not qualify as a miscellaneous venue, but for purposes of your board meeting, that is what you would use. Thank you. So I want to just, uh, so thank you, Mrs. Thornton, for giving us this presentation. I think it's, it's important that people understand that uh, we're not meeting in person, not because we don't want to. I, I mean, I would certainly like to be with my fellow board members, and, and uh, I, I think we just do better business that way. We get to know each other better. The challenge is, legally, we can't right now. Um, but I think the bigger issue here is that we want to hear from the people that we represent. So one way to do that is email. We've had several people email us. Uh, we want to know what you think. We want you to be heard. We want to hear you. And so one way to do that is through email. Uh, I believe it's go under the go to the Pasco District School District website under the board. You can email the board. Please feel free to send us your comments. But the, the I think the most common way is in a meeting. People want to be heard. They can come and share their thoughts, their feelings, their ideas with us. It was great tonight to hear from people directly. Uh, I wish we could, I, I don't know if there was others who wanted to, to say anything. If they're like me, they wait till the last minute and then, it, uh, then it's too late. So I would, I would like to think that we would have more time, maybe next time that we hear everybody, that we just, we just listen to what they have to say until everybody's had a chance and we've called three times and nobody comes up. So I, I think it's important though, that people know that, that they are important to us. One way to do that is in-person meetings. Um, and I think we need to work to get back there as soon as we can. Granted, there are some challenges with this, trying to get everybody in a room, we would be limited capacity. And so some people would feel left out. So, um, anyway, I like the way we're doing it. I just hope the next time we can we can accommodate everybody who wants to to speak, assuming there are more people who want to speak. So, Mr. Christensen, just to clarify, everyone who had their hand raised tonight was allowed to speak. So there wasn't anyone who was left out. Well, I, I, I would beg to differ with you because I think I mean, we I know there was a call, but we limited it right there, and that that list was growing as we went through it. So I I don't know that everybody had a chance to speak, but but everybody who was acknowledged was able to speak. I just think it would be, if we, if we can let everybody, you know, get to the end and make sure everybody's had a chance. And I think it would be. Yeah, I just didn't want you to think there were hands raised that we ignored, so. Right, no, I, I, yes, I agree. So, but anyway, I think it's important that we give community members an opportunity to speak and, and hear them all. Thanks for the presentation. I appreciate your feedback, Steve. I um, I would love to meet in person as well. I realize this is difficult, and we, and I don't want to lose the component of sometimes when we, it's just like teaching. Sometimes when we're all when a teacher is teaching some in person and some online, the people who are online are the ones who get lost. So if we do do this, I want to make sure that we don't um, we don't lose anybody, and we can still we can still be seen and heard, and that and that um, people who do want to make comments can be can be there. I certainly like I certainly enjoy hearing from people directly rather than reading letters. So that was that was really nice tonight. Are there any more comments on this public um, open meeting meetings act? No, I just, I think we should revisit this as a board um, at the time when we uh, move out of phase one and quote unquote business meetings are allowed. <laughs> Talk about it again as a board and see. Yeah, we certainly can't do it until it's allowed, but hopefully we'll get there soon. 
And I will, President Phillips, I will continue to keep the board updated on the status of um, the requirements um, once we, we get a better idea around what those dates would be. And, and you know, we'll make sure, it, it absolutely goes without saying that we will make sure that it's safe for, for staff and board members and, and our students and that there's options there as well. So thank you. Um, we will now move on to the best part of our presentation, at least the funnest part, I feel like, the most fun part. We have our three um, student reps. They are going to talk to us this evening about what they learned at our online board conference this year. So I will turn the time over to um, Mrs. Whitney. She can introduce them and then the girls can do their thing. So board president Phillips, members of the board, I too look forward every year to our student board representative presentation. It is definitely a highlight anytime we get to spend time with our student board reps. So with that, it is my extraordinary honor to turn it over to our student board reps and Brisa, are you starting? So Brisa, thank you. Good evening, President Phillips, members of the board and Superintendent Whitney. So the representatives for um, the school decided to compile this presentation for you all and we'll get started with the overall theme that we saw. So we saw overall a message of hope about moving towards new horizons and coming up with ideas on how to tackle issues that come within our community. We've seen a lot of different issues when it comes to um, racial justice, when it comes to COVID-19 and things like that. So it's all about being resilient and moving forward and being able to have a positive mindset and thinking about hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And another theme was being able to get out of our comfort zones and try new things. Um, Nichelle and Crystal will add some highlights that we had, for example, in our experiences with um, meeting the other student board reps. That was one of my favorites personally, because we got to connect with them and see their ideas. So um, the overall message is just being hopeful and making sure that we all are going to be having a growth mindset when it comes to tackling COVID-19 in an online environment. And I will introduce Krista Martinez from Pasco High. Hi. So our next theme that we discussed and we really were able to learn in all adaptions from every program that we were able to see was embracing differences. So their theme was that equity is foundational. Educational equity can only exist when a student's level of opportunity and achievement cannot be predicted by race, characteristics, and circumstances. We also discussed the connections and communication with the community. This includes our analyzing of the environment and what we're going through that time. Just as Brisa said, it really depends on, you know, every community has something going on, whether it's poverty or their economy or situations that just happen. Um, and taking surveys, having surveys available to everyone in the community, no matter where they live or what they're a part of. Um, it was just the factors of opportunity, necessity, and passion, ensuring that students were safe all among our school and program. So overall, we discussed the importance of identifying and eliminating this discriminatory practices and processes. And I'm really proud to be involved in our work that we are putting into in our diversity, equity, and inclusion. So next we have Delta High School Student Board Rep, Michelle Lynn. Uh, one last thing we wanted to talk about was the student board representative across the state. So something that we all enjoyed was the very last event we had, which is when they brought in all the student reps and we all discussed where we were from and what we enjoyed doing for the board. Um, something else we discussed was maybe creating a newsletter for the students from us. Basically, it's for the students from what we do during these meetings in a way that they can understand better. We also talked about utilizing social media and apps. So for my school, we use uh, Remind, but my class also uses Discord where we talk to each other. So talk, having uh, being able to talk to the other students is really important. And yeah, and just bringing new ideas to the board like those. 
So as the student board reps finish their presentation, I and I don't I haven't done this in the past, but I'm going to this year. I'm going to highlight my favorite session. And my favorite session was the session where our student board reps talked about being student board representatives. So thank you to board member Christensen, who was connected and afforded our student board reps the opportunity to do a videotaped session. And then it was played during the WASDA conference. And um, I know I'm biased, but it was the best session at the conference and our student board representatives hit it out of the park. So if you ever want to look like a gifted speaker, just sit next to the student board reps and you'll 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 be a gifted speaker. So thank you to our student board representatives for representing us well across the state and Steve for affording us that opportunity and Amy also for participating. So thank you, student board representatives. You ladies did do a great job. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, we will turn the time back over to Superintendent Whitney for future agenda items. And um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Amy, can I comment just quickly as well? Thank you. So I agree with uh, Superintendent Whitney. Our, our student reps did a great job at that uh, conference. And here's, here's the unfortunate thing about not having open public meetings is we have been in remote meetings with these young ladies all year. Unfortunately, we have not been in the same room. We've, we've never met. And it, uh, you know, it's sad for me to, to do that. I hope before this is over that we get a chance to meet and uh, hopefully it's not graduation. But uh, anyway, I look forward to open public meetings when or being able to meet in person when we can meet you young ladies and, and uh, get to rub shoulders with you, not remotely, but literally. So thank you for that presentation. So future agenda items, we will have a study session focused on election planning and we'll be talking about uh, potential future bond planning and then levy election planning. We do have a, our levy, our current levy is expiring. So there's a levy election that will need to occur in 2022. February of 2022 is we typically run levies in February. Certainly that's a board decision. It's not predetermined that you would run it in February but 2022 would be the timing based on when our current levy expires. So we'll be having that conversation as part of the study session on the 26th. During the meeting, we, as tradition during COVID, we'll have a COVID health condition and COVID response, like educating students in a COVID environment update and report. You're also scheduled for a budget presentation as a board, you asked for more regular budget presentations. So this would be your budget presentation for January. And then we're scheduled for you to discuss path forward around the Voting Rights Act. So that would be the reports for our January board meeting. I did want to remind the board of the district's request for an executive session under 4231101G for personnel, which is uh, focused on the superintendent evaluation. Amy, how much time do you think you'll need? I think we can get done in about 48 minutes. Does that sound good? Yep. So there's a 40 minute executive session request and there'll be no action following. So thank you, Board President Phillips. Thank you. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>